Um, yeah, I'm Phil Squire, uh, raised in Wellington, went to school with some hats, uh, grew up in Kandala, and uh, now living in Tai Tai and working for Sustainability Trust. So uh, yeah, thanks to uh, Roger Blakey for inviting me along here today um, as the uh, putting up my name forward for talk a little bit about healthy housing. Well, now this the big one. Big one. Yeah. Great. Okay, so a little bit about um, sustainability trust. So we are based. Uh, our offices are based down um, just off Tory Street, a lane called Foresters Lane, and opposite Bunnings. Uh, we have a. <coughs> we've been around yeah since about two thousand three, two thousand four, and in Wellington since uh, about twenty eleven. Wellington, uh, just this particular spot here. Um, so we have a, an eco centre. Uh, it's about a two hundred square metre. Um, building with, with uh, I guess, model homes, um, displays and education, and all our office staff are there as well as a warehouse. So the main programs we run are our smart homes area, so that's uh, doing installation, heating, ventilation, um, anything to do with the residential building. And then also we have an e-waste, so you can drop off your computers, anything like, uh, like that to us, we will recycle them. And we have an education component, so that's we work with schools, um, businesses, and so that's around sustainability, anything to do with waste, waste energy and water conservation. We have an eco shop, so um, that's a bit of an advertisement if you want to drop down Forrester's Lane. And uh, we have um, anything that's uh, low, low impact um, and sustainable uh, on, on site. We have a program called Warm Fund, these are well homes, and so that works intensively with low income families with high health needs. And then we have our Wellington Curtain Bank, which a lot of people I think may have heard about, the drop of curtains to us. And they get um, upgraded and handed over for free to the household in the Wellington region. So I'm here today to talk a little bit about warm, um, dry, and safe housing. So uh, <clears throat> to put a question: what, what does warm, dry, and safe mean? So in terms of our definitions, uh, we would say that warm, dry, and safe means that it's a house is, is warm and affordable to heat. Ability is a really key concept. I'll touch on a little bit about later. Uh, has adequate ventilation, so in other words, there has it's either ventilated mechanically, or people are able to open windows to let air, air flow through, and it's free from hazards and promotes a sense of security. And I guess you know when you think about hazards, it, it's uh, um, windows that close, um, floors that don't have holes in them, um, roofs that don't have holes in them, and also a sense of security. So that's kind of talking about the neighbourhood that, that you live in, and that the occupants have security of tenure. So that's a real challenge with our housing at the moment. Uh, with high demand, especially for rent, rental housing stock, and um, a, a, a low income families who are challenged with, with uh, not being able to maintain a secure place uh, means that their kids are constantly need, need to move schools. And so, that's having that, that ability to be able to stay in a place for a long period of time is really key. So, Wellington Region Housing, so um, we've got about 185,000 homes, that's from 2018. Um, Around about 60% of those are owned or mortgaged. 26% uh, are private rental, and then 6% social housing, and then there's a, the, the remainder will be others, so maybe family trusts. Um, interesting stats so, around about 4.5% of households in Wellington City don't use any heating at all, so that's, that's from the census. So, there's the folks who will either, I mean, there might be some. You know, hard old lizards among us who would never ever turn on a heater, even in a, in a southerly gale. But uh, a lot, lot of households are not able to, to um, heat, afford heating as well. And there's an estimate that came out with the electricity price review that at least 10,000 households in Wellington um, are in energy hardship. We expect that actually to be a lot higher than that. It's a very, very uh, um, conservative estimate. So, significant um, need in Wellington. When we start talking about housing quality, um, so <clears throat> you know the, there was a survey that was done in 2015, 2016 by Brands that was um, looking at some of the house conditions. That's the best model we have at the moment, although our Wellington Regional Healthy Housing Group is doing um, some more work on, on defining what actual quality is for Wellington, uh, the region. So around about 46% of bedrooms are unheated in, in, in that study. So it's almost half of the bedrooms within, within um, New Zealand are unheated. So mold is a big mold problem, which is an indicator of damp. Um, and then over half of the homes who are not insulated or under insulated in the ceiling or underfloor. So in half of bedrooms and kitchens with no extractor fans, so that's a real another mold indicator. 
and in rentals or you know suppliers are generally in poor condition owner occupied um, and basically that sits a part of the weakness around our, our rental uh, rental laws is that um, the where, where, where the pro product maybe is not as fit for service as, as um, homeowners and, and landlords generally will tend to un under invest under invest in these particular assets so Poor quality housing at least the um, significant health impacts and a lot of this work has been um, documented and this is where I think the rubber starts hitting the road it's kind of academic before that. Um, so in New Zealand there's, um, so Michael Baker mentioned this figure last night on the news, um, there's around about 1600 excess winter deaths from respiratory and circulatory conditions. So that means that uh, in summer there'll be a certain death rate and then there'll be um, a spike coming into winter and the reasons for this are not well understood um, but they're it's very likely to be due with um, cold especially within, uh, internal cold cold conditions and, um, and higher transmission of diseases due to the crowding so for the kids this is really hard so um, there are uh, children um, <clears throat> Admitted to, to hospital for diseases associated with healthy housing, like uh, respiratory diseases, asthma, are twice as likely to be readmitted later on in their lives. So it has a real impact on the on the young. Um, when we talk about housing sensitive hospitaliz hospitalization rates, it's a tongue twister, um, they're strongly correlated with homes in high deprivation index areas. So again, it's an equity issue. And uh, we, the regional housing group pulled together some figures um, for Wellington and. So, the, within Wellington, there was a, almost 6,000 um, hospitalized for children under 15, and 27% 20 of those in deprivation, in the high deprivation indexes. So, again, an equity issue. And interestingly, in Morty, who's a research um, group, uh, they showed that the Walmart New Zealand Insulation Program, which put insulation heating into low income homes, showed a benefit of six to one. So in other words, like for every dollar of government money that went in to um, insulating and low-income houses showed a, a cost benefit um, for the medical, for the health system of, of six dollars for every one dollar investment. And mainly that was to do with reduced hospitalization um, and uh, prescriptions. So what was the government doing about it? Uh, no, uh, has anyone heard about the housing approval breaks in Okay. Fascinating piece of uh, legislation. 1947 was when uh, the soldiers were coming back from the war and um, the government decided, well, we need to do some, something about housing because everyone was just throwing up shanties and, and living in any old house. So the, the basic um, regulations came in around, around that point prescribing how high the ceiling should be, um, how, much, how many windows you needed to have within, within a room, uh, about freedom from damp. I went back and did the, looked at the New Zealand Ar Wellington archives from 1997, and some of the uh, <clears throat> some of the regs came came from there um, originally too. Uh, they also had things like do not throw animals, dead animals, in waterways. So there's a far-reaching legislation. Uh, there's also the, um, so the so the housing group regulations are, are um, the new law right at the end, the Healthy Homes Guarantee Act, has a, has a basis in that 1947 regulation, which is still you know, still in play. Um, so there's also the Warm Up New Zealand uh, Warmer Kiwi Homes Insulation Program that's been running since 2003, and so that um, is, provides subsidies for low-income households for um, insulation uh, in the ceilings and underfloors. Uh, the Residential Tenancies Amendment Act in 2016 that required insulation and smoke alarms for all rental properties, and so that's uh, in place right now. And then there's the new Healthy Homes Guarantee Act, um, which came in in 2017, and the Healthy Homes Standards. This is a bit of a game changer for rental properties. Uh, means that all rental properties by 2024 have to be insulated, heated, ventilated, um, have a ground vapor barrier and, um, and, dra and draft stocking. So it's basically setting a um, minimum standard for rental properties across the private and social housing sector. Our sustainability trust, we would tend to say it's quite a little bit weak and needs to be strengthened, but at least it's a good start. So um, there is a whole range of uh, programs that are operating in the community at the moment to assist uh, around those regulations themselves, but also um, uh, programs that, that are gap fillers. Um, organizations like Sustainability Trust, we tend to work between business and, and government, and we, we kind of do, do the work that we, we consider that maybe it's not being supported by, by central or local government. 
So there's a program called Well Homes, which you may not have heard about. I don't know if anybody's heard about the Health Housing Initiative, um, which is the Ministry of Health's response to rheumatic fever um, challenges. And that it's been running for about five years. High incidence of rheumatic fever um, within the North Island, and a lot of the DHBs were instructed to um, develop programs to reduce crowding in, in low income housing. And it's interesting, the, the, uh, no one really quite knows how rheumatic fever um, is, is transmitted, um, but the, the, main, the main outcome of this program was to encourage um, kids when they're sleeping to get their heads away from each other. And so a lot of families who are struggling. Uh, tend to have uh, um, kids all sleeping together in the same same room, maybe the one more warm room in the house. And so this program is like, how do we, basically, how do we um, avoid crowding within the house? Uh, and this is getting a lot of it's around getting kids to sleep sleep in their own in their own bedrooms. But the, the challenge to a lot of these kids don't have beds, so it's really really basic stuff. So um, this program here, Well Homes, which we're a part of. Um, goes and identifies the high health needs families who have uh, uh, either rheumatic fever, um, a risk of rheumatic fever or other health conditions and a low income. And they're referred through uh, various health agencies and DHBs. Then there's a comprehensive assessment and by a range of organisations are part of our partnership. And then there are recommendations for, um, for solutions. The government in its wisdom went ahead and, and uh, paid for the administration and the assess ability to assess if the number to do anything about it. So, you know, that's a, a, another thing, thing for another day. So we, we have to work, work internally to try and raise the money to um, support the interventions that, that are needed for those families. There's Warmer Kiwi Homes, which I mentioned before, which has been going for, um, it's early, early uh, since 2003, but the last program has, has been running for um, two years and there's another two years to go. So that's uh, aimed at low income ha homes and also specifically at the deprivation, high deprivation index areas. And so the subsidy has gone up significantly. It's like 90 to 100 percent for low-income families now. So almost free to be able to insulate and, and heat um, low-income homes. In the Wellington region, we expect to do around about 800 or so a year. And there are a range of uh, organisations to support that. Uh, Wellington City Council, Charitable Trust, and Electra up in Carpenter Coast also adding extra support on. That. Uh, well, actually, we also work with Wellington City Council for our Home Energy Savers Program, which is around about a thousand homes a year that can detail home system to make action plans. So that, that's uh, looking at ways to save people money and to warm up their homes. And there's also something called the Home Fit. Has anybody heard of the Green, New Zealand Green Building Council? Good. Now they, they have a, um, a, a rating system called Home Fit, which says that these are the minimum standards that, that a home should, should meet. And so this provides a, a nationally um, recognised um, baseline um, for housing. The challenge is the voluntary standard. And um, I think in my experience, without um, regulation uh, and, and mandatory, like with cars, warrant of fitness, uh, you're always going to be struggling um, to get uh, a, a voluntary standard to be take, taken up um, widely. So now moving on to our uh, what we're doing in Wellington region. So the Wellington region, around about two, three years ago, um, we had a stakeholder group um, at the Q Hotel in, in uh, Wellington to look at getting all the organisations who are involved in healthy housing throughout the region um, into a, um, a cohesive network. And over, over the um, last couple of years, we've formed um, the group uh, called the Wellington Regional Healthy Housing Group, of which uh, Roger Blakeford here is, is the chair. It, it, Consists of around about 50 or 60 organisations, NGOs, um, research, government, uh, some uh, rental, rental groups, um, <clears throat> to come to, come together to collaborate, net, network, and produce solutions across across the region. The idea is really to avoid silo, silos and all the individual organisations work, working on their own. So we have a, a working group um, that is uh, call ourselves the heavy lifters, uh, with representatives from regional council. Uh, Hutt City Council, Otago, um, ourselves, Regional Public Health, and um, BHB and Green Building Council. And so, and we actually, we, last year we employed an executive officer um, on, on point eight to, to go put the work together. So, in our current work streams, we have a research study on the housing situation needs in the region, which is quite a, um, a far reaching and detailed um, approach to really say where are we in Wellington, because we need to know exactly what our base is, you know, how many homes are meeting the standard, how many are. Um, and what, where are they? And then we're also um, having um, focus on initial projects 
think development and delivery, um, which I'll talk about just in a moment. So that's kind of where we are now. I'm just going to look a little bit ahead on the government side, if anybody here is into, into policy. Um, so the electricity price review, which was um, Megan Woods uh, uh, had a focus on about a year ago. Um, it's been a bit slow around the COVID situation, but, but recently um, they had a strong recommendation that there was, there was energy hardship in New Zealand, obviously, and, uh, and there was a $17 million was, was um, put towards the form of energy hardship group. And the energy hardship group is, is a group that um, has to be uh, formed by October 2020 and have a specific focus on, on low income housing and struggles for people to stay warm, warm and dry. And so this will be, a, I guess, similar to have the Climate Change Commission. In other words, there'll be, uh, hopefully, we hope there'll be an independent chair and reporting directly to the minister about re recommendations um, for uh, supporting low income households. Uh, there's uh, another really exciting bit of um, legislation or, or um, policy around the medically dependent vulnerable consumer guidelines. I don't know if anyone remembered maybe Ago, was that Mercury Energy shut off um, the power mm -hmm. to um, a household and, um, and a woman in there who was on a, I guess, a oxygen machine yeah, died. And so that um, was a really unfortunate um, situation. And, and so, and because of that, um, Mercury Energy, I guess, it really led the charge and, and these, these guidelines were introduced so that nobody who nominated themselves as being med med medically dependent could be cut off without notification. So these guidelines are, are um, in play now um, to be re-evaluated re re by, by December uh, 2020. And this provi um, potentially provides a, everybody in New Zealand has a relationship with an electricity retailer. How many people are on Genesis? Do they know your electricity retailer? How many people don't know the electricity retailer? Everyone, everyone knows anyone? Okay, Genesis. Um, because the, the, the incumbents, um, Pulse, Trusty Power, Contact, any small retailers like PowerShop? Yeah, I mean, interesting. Gen used to be back, back a, a number of years ago, there used to be just, just the, um, the, big, the big four, big, big five. And so there's been, there's been a lot, lot more electricity retailers have come on um, since. But you know, the, the idea is every, everybody has an electricity retailer um, connection. And so um, this is a, an opportunity for uh, people who come on, um, uh, sign up with a retailer to actually identify who, who's coming on, onto, you, onto your um, organization and then to identify where those people have any vulnerabilities and then to be able to treat them up front rather than later. And then, uh, so then there's also HomeFit, which I, I mentioned before. Um, we would love to get HomeFit to be a nationally recognised um, program across New Zealand and to be man mandatory. And I'll talk about our, our regional projects now just to finish up. So across, across the region, um, we have poor housing. There are a number of areas that are, are significantly um, uh, lower income and of higher, higher health needs. And the regional housing group has identified two of those. Uh, one, one is Ōtaki and one, one is Wainuamata. And so these particular areas are, um, have, I guess, higher, higher needs. Um, and then, then the, our target now is, is, is to upgrade these homes. Significant projects um, requiring multi-million dollars of funding. We put in um, some funding to the uh, shovel ready projects over, over the last, um, in May, and we've yet to see the result, results of those. Um, but these are, if we, we can make a difference in these, these particular areas particularly with the high, the, um, high deprivation, will make a significant impact on the housing uh, and the, the health in the, those areas. And so that, that particular project that the housing group is working on at the moment to, to raise, raise that funding. So for us, it's, uh, I guess for the regional health and housing group, and we see that as a significant significant investment of the time, especially our executive office can be putting into that. And so we're gonna be uh, going around the region over the next six months to a year and trying to raise the funding for that. 